Father, we come humbly to the throne of grace. No pride, no merit, no boasting, no strutting, no swagger. We come as lowly beggars on our hands and knees. We come as little children with arms raised high. We come as loyal servants longing for entrance. God, we know who you are. And we know who we are. You are the creator. And we are the creation. You are holy. And we are sinners. We were created for your pleasure. May you receive pleasure from what takes place today. May you use our little gathering to encourage the discouraged, to save the lost, to build your church, and to further your gospel. This is our corporate plea. Amen. Today is um, my fifth anniversary as your preaching pastor. And it's been a wild ride since the that very first Easter. Uh, last year, <laughs> I proclaimed the empty tomb from an empty auditorium. Uh, thank you, COVID. Uh, this year, I'm excited about proclaiming the empty tomb to a full auditorium. Now, I want to address something specific that I see going on around Easter at churches. It's extremely disturbing to me. I'm seeing churches, particularly pastors, Try to make the resurrection of Jesus Christ into a little pep talk about getting through hard times. They use the resurrection text like a therapeutic gimmick. And lots of church-going folk are so self-consumed, craving to be affirmed, craving for the world to revolve around them that they don't even recognize it. Like when Stephen Furtick begins his Easter service by saying, We did not come to commemorate resurrection we came expecting resurrection. And he goes on to use the resurrection account as a way you can overcome something difficult in life. And he says, and I quote, What are you calling, why are you calling a situation dead that God sees as an opportunity for a resurrection? Don't say your job hunt is dead. It's just waiting for a resurrection. Don't say your love life is dead. It's just waiting for a resurrection. And that makes me want to pull a Martin and just like, just throw up in my mouth. They say things like, well, Jesus had a third day experience. Now you need to be ready for your third day experience. Does the author's intent matter at all anymore? Jesus didn't rise from the dead so I could give you a psychological pep talk on expect God to resurrect what other people are saying is dead in your life. You have this account in the scriptures because your sin is an all-out affront on the holiness of God. Instead of letting you die in your sin and experience his wrath for all eternity, God clothed himself in flesh and invaded time and space to become one of us. Jesus, the God-man, lived among us to reach us. He came to live in our place and he did it perfectly. It was the plan of God for man to kill him because a perfect sacrifice was needed. It was the plan of God for him to rise from the dead because that was the only way sin could be atoned for. The resurrection was the Father's amen to Jesus's, it is finished. Now, I've never been one to beat around the bush, and I'm not going to start today. I do not deny my agenda. If you're not a Christian, I want you to become one. Even if you've met one. Or God didn't answer your prayer as a child. Because the foundation of the Christian faith isn't Christians or answered prayers. It's the resurrection. And most historians, whether Christian or non-Christian, agree that 2,000 years ago, an entirely new movement and community were formed almost overnight. Immediately, hundreds of people started claiming Jesus rose from the dead, even though they knew they could die for saying it. And it had rippling effects. One pastor said, within 15 years of the resurrection, the church in Jerusalem grew from a very small number 
to 100,000 people. Jerusalem only had 200,000 people. Billy Graham, the evangelist, the old evangelist used to quip, there is more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived or that Alexander the Great died at age 33. Charles Spurgeon said, the resurrection is a fact better attested than any event recorded in any history, whether ancient or modern. Today, one-third of the world's population will gather to celebrate. Get this, this Jewish guy who only went public for about three years. And here's something you may have never thought about because you have jobs to work, kids to care for, bills to pay. But the people that brought us the story of Jesus' resurrection present themselves as cowards. They wrote themselves into the story as cowards. When Jesus died, their hopes died. No one was standing outside the tomb going, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Sheepishly, but honestly, they admit, we were surprised he rose. Christians, Christian, here is why today's text matters for you. If the resurrection isn't true, you should go home. Because religion makes a lame hobby. Non-Christian. Here's why today's text matters for you. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept everything that he said. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? And why argue with us about it? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching. But whether or not he rose from the dead. Now I want to give you a listening guide to uh, a listening grid to process my exposition. And you type A'ers, you will love this. I mean you already have your pen clicked and you are ready to write and take notes. Uh, the rest of you will be like, get me away from the outline and into the story. But, but these, there are five scenes in today's text. And here they are. The tomb is empty. The tomb is open and empty. The scriptures are opened and fulfilled. Their eyes are opened and they realize. Their hearts are opened and they believe. Heaven was opened and Jesus ascended. Now, I used to, I used to teach preaching, homiletics, and I would always tell my guys, an outline has never changed anyone's life. And that's still true. But if an outline could, this, this would be the one. This would be the one, and I I wish you were a little more excited about it. The the tomb is open and empty. The scriptures are opened and fulfilled. Their eyes are opened and they realize. Their hearts are opened and they believe. Heaven was opened and Jesus ascended. Thank you. Uh, when, When the disciples buried Jesus, they had to do it quickly. They hurriedly applied some spices but did not give the full treatment that they would have given a loved one's body. That's why we find in verse 1, notice what the text says, on the first day of the week at early dawn, they, now that's the women, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. These ladies left at the crack of dawn to finish the job. And when they arrived, verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now they're standing there with their jaws on the ground. And suddenly two angels in dazzling apparel appear. And the women let the rest of their bodies join their jaws and they fall on the ground. And they were not bowing because it was bright. Uh, Turning your head could have shaded the brightness. They bowed because they were in the presence of heavenly beings. And these majestic beings say, why are you looking for the living one? In a cemetery. Pick it up in verse 6. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. You can draw a little light bulb by verse 8 because that's when it turned on for these ladies. One of the ladies was Mary Magdalene. Verse 10 tells us that. She used to be possessed by a demon. 
but now she is the lead witness of the resurrection. And I could go into detail about all of the women, but I will not. I do want to go into detail about the significance of women in this passage. This is another way Luke is letting us know that he is recording a historical account and not writing a legend. The repeated names of, of the women are source citations. We could call them footnotes. These women must have been alive at the time that Luke was writing or he wouldn't have cited their names. By including their names, Luke was saying to anyone reading, if you want to check out the truthfulness of my story, go talk to these three women. They're still alive and they can corroborate everything I have said. Now, if you're here today and you think that the resurrection was the greatest hoax in human history, let me ask you to consider something. If the disciples were sitting at Starbucks conversing on how to get the most people to believe this lie of the resurrection, would they have the primary witnesses as women? Celsus, a, a Greek philosopher who lived in the second century, he was highly antagonistic toward Christianity, and he wrote a number of works listing arguments against it. And one of the arguments he believed most telling went like this. Christianity can't be true because the written accounts of the resurrection are based on the testimony of women. And, I quote here, we all know women are hysterical. Now, again, that was Celsus. I did not say that. It's Celsus. And many of Celsus's readers agreed. For them, it was a major problem. In ancient societies, a woman's testimony was considered unreliable, not accepted by the court. If people were trying to make this believable, they would have written women out of the story. Instead, they are the first eyewitnesses to Jesus' empty tomb. And the only possible reason for the presence of women in these accounts is that they really were present and reported what they saw. We find in the text that these ladies immediately ran to the other disciples. And they unpacked what had just taken place. Verse 11, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. The apostles blew the women off. They persisted in their bedrock unbelief. Now apparently some were curious because Luke records Peter jumping to his feet and running to the tomb, stooping down and seeing Jesus' clothes all folded neatly where he used to lay. When Jesus left the tomb, he didn't leave it like most of you left your room this morning. He made his bed. Peter walked away puzzled, shaking his head. Then the narrative pivots to two other followers of Christ. They are not two of the 11 apostles. We learn that later. But they are two of the faithful inner core of this broad group of disciples. One of them is named Cleopas. And the other is nameless. Maybe Cleopas' wife. Maybe a, a friend, another man. Either way, they left their home in Emmaus to follow Jesus, their Messiah. But now they're going back home. They've packed their bags. They have thrown away their sermon notes. They've tossed out their Jesus as the Messiah stickers. They're going back home, dejected, disillusioned, and even despairing. And it would have been a seven-mile journey. And that's a lot of highway to shed tears ask questions, and vent their disappointments. Verse 14 says they were talking. It says that in the English. The Greek sheds a little more light. They're arguing and debating, recalling this and retelling that. If you listen closely, you can, you can hear the heated banter. The first guy, the unnamed one, says, I, I thought for sure Jesus was the promised one. I mean, I'm not imagining things, right? He did say multiple times that he would bring the kingdom. Maybe he was a phony, like all the other self-proclaimed messiahs. How did we miss it, Cletus? I'm imagining that's what everyone nicknamed Cleopas, Cletus. And then Cletus responds, I don't know. But we still have to explain all the miracles. I mean, remember he fed 15,000 people with the kids' lunchable. Re remember that man who was crippled for years. He's still walking to this day in town. 
They go back and forth. These guys are just inconsolable in their grief. And there's even a hint of anger. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, (laughs) Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now the verb indicates that Jesus overtook them from behind. He just sort of slid up behind them and walked along. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They did not recognize Christ because Christ did not allow them. At least not yet. And notice, they were not freaked out when Jesus began walking with them. That tells us something about what resurrected bodies look like. Resurrected bodies do not look like aliens. Jesus didn't slide up behind them looking like, looking like this. You know, I think they would have noticed. This guy doesn't look like us. Now, nor are resurrected bodies thriving souls inside of old dead skin, like this picture. If I were walking and old Edgar came walking up beside me, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I think I would notice something doesn't look right. But these disciples looked at Jesus like a normal human being. He was identifiable as a human, but not identical to his earthly body. These guys thought Jesus was another worshiper, returning, disappointed worshiper, returning home from Jerusalem. And I don't know how far into this two-hour walk they are, but somewhere in it, Jesus rolls up on them and asks, verse 17, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other? You can amplify the question to read, what are you talking about that's gotten you so upset? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then Cletus answered, look at verse 18. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there? (laughs) Now, we don't know much about Cletus, but he will ever be remembered for what he said here. Uh, Where have you been that you haven't heard about this? Do you live with your head in the sand? Were you under a rock? (laughs) Jesus thinks, yeah, well, kind of. The Lord has a sense of humor, and he plays along. He says, what's going on? What did I miss? Verse 19. They said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped. So hope is gone now. Had hoped. But we had hoped. That he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. I want you to notice that these men know the facts of the gospel, but they don't yet recognize the face of the gospel. Their problem is not intellectual. The problem is not that they don't know some things they need to know. The problem is spiritual. They need their eyes opened. They need a revelation. And that's one reason, by the way, why we pray for the Spirit to open our eyes to behold wonderful things from God's Word. Now the casual reader, progressing along in the story, might think, Now, Lord, now's the time. Tell them who you are. But Jesus doesn't do that. Why not? Well, I believe it was because their faith in Christ was currently tied to what they could see. And Jesus wanted their faith to be tied not merely to sight, but to Scripture. Jesus knows that our faith should not be rooted only in a personal experience. It should be rooted in the Bible. And here in scene two, the minds of these disciples are going to be opened. To the scriptures. Verse 25. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart. Just pause there. Pause there for a moment. So slow hearted. No description in the Bible describes me more than this phrase. Slow hearted. Slow to believe. 
O foolish ones and slow of heart, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Now let's pause here for a moment. Moses, that's the first five books of the Old Testament. Prophets, that's the rest of the Old Testament. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The word translated interpreted gives us our word for hermeneutics, uh, Bible study. Jesus gave them the hermeneutics for interpreting the Old Testament. Now what was it? Well, this could be rendered literally in all the parts or from all the books of Scripture, Jesus explained to them how they applied to himself. So he opened Exodus and he said, you can't fully understand this book until you see it in light of me. He opened Nehemiah in 1 Samuel and said, you can't fully understand this book until you see it in light of me. Jesus gives a one-hour crash course on Christ-centered expository preaching from the Old Testament. Since Jesus believes the whole Bible is about him, that means it can't be all about us. It is possible to know Bible stories, but miss the story of the Bible. It is possible to read Hebrew like the Pharisees and miss the axis of the Bible. It's possible to know all about the showbread and where the rocks came from to build the temple, but miss that Jesus is the center of the Bible. Now, a qualifier. I'm not saying that Jesus is in every verse. Or that under every rock in the Old Testament, Jesus is hiding. No. What Jesus is saying is essentially this. All the plot lines converge on me. All the themes of salvation meet in me. Even in our church, we've walked through the books of Esther and Ruth and Daniel and Hosea, Ecclesiastes, Nehemiah, Exodus. We've modeled this for you. We are deeply committed to preaching the entire Bible, but also preaching it Christocentrically. We are committed to opening a scripture, teaching it, and pointing you to the hero of the Bible. I think it was uh, Tim Keller or maybe Tony Morita, one of them, who said that the Old Testament is like the movie The Sixth Sense. The first time you watch it, uh, you don't realize what's going on until the end. And then you realize, oh, Bruce Willis is, I hope you haven't sent, you're not planning to watch it. Oh, Bruce Willis is dead. <laughs> then you go back and watch it again and say, oh, I missed it before. I see it now. <laughs> Similar. Jesus brings full meaning to the Old Testament now. And, and you can go back and read the earlier parts and it makes sense. When these two disciples arrived at Emmaus, their home, Jesus kept walking. They still don't know who he is yet, but the scriptures are opening their eyes to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. They urged Jesus, just, just stay here with us. It's been a long day. It's nearly dark. Jesus agreed, and he went into the house. And in verse 30, when Jesus was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. <laughs> this is interesting. Jesus just kind of takes over the house. That's not his house. That's not his table. He just comes in and kind of takes over the house. Some people do this. Some of you do this. Uh, my my mother-in-law does this. Every time she visits, she's, she's cleaning everything, reorganizing everything. Like, where are the spoons? Sarah's like, my mom moved them. Now, I open the fridge. There's lots of organic substitutes. Uh, no sour cream, just Greek yogurt. No, no sugar, just stevia. I, mean, I look on the back. It, it doesn't say made in China. How can I trust it? It says made in hell. She's making dinner and all the ingredients are out. There's no breadcrumbs. Just chia seeds. What are chia seeds? I know what chia pets are. If you love your children, you'd buy one. I think that's the best invention 
Let me get back. Well, Jesus did these things, not the organic substitutes, but the kitchen takeover. And Luke has a, a minor theme of feasting running throughout the book. In fact, if you study the book of Luke, some scholars say that this is the eighth meal in the book. And this meal is on Sunday, but it's really unlike any other day of the week. It's really the introduction of a brand new day, the everlasting day, the resurrection day. Augustine calls it the eighth day. The eighth meal on the eighth day. In the original language, it literally says Jesus handed a piece of bread to each of them. And when they received the bread, not when they ate the bread, not when he broke the bread, not when they, not when they saw the bread, but when they received the bread from his hands, verse 31, their eyes were opened. It was at that moment when they reached out and took bread from his nail-pierced hands that the light suddenly dawned. And the reason I believe Jesus showed them his hands last is because he wanted to show them the scriptures first. Our hope is not anchored in what we see around us. It is anchored in what God has said to us. Our faith rests on facts, credible evidence. Now, I want to give a little application here to those of you who, who hate the road you're on. You've been traveling a lot longer than seven miles filled with tears and frustration. And some of you are thinking, you know, I, I live on No Hope Road. Well, you may think, well, somehow, you know, God doesn't have a plan for me or his plans for me have failed. Well, you are exactly where the disciples were because they thought God's plan had failed. Friend, Jesus Christ knows where you are geographically, spiritually, emotionally. He knows what path you're on. Are you without hope? Go back to the scriptures. They have a way of pointing you to the author. And he is everything you really need. Your lack of hope is rooted and not believing the word of God about Christ. Verse 31. Verse 31 tells us that once they realize who Jesus is, immediately he vanishes from their sight. Now this is interesting. Uh, this is not like that YouTube trend where you stand behind a blanket, throw it up in the air, and then slip into a side room where your dog just wonders where you went. No, Jesus didn't slip into a side room. He vanished. He gave them what they needed. All they needed was to know that he was risen. Verse 32, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? <laughs> when you come to your personal Bible study, come with this attitude. God, set my heart on fire. Fill me afresh with passion. When you come to corporate worship, don't come as a judge or a critic standing over Scripture. Don't come as a consumer looking to be entertained or have your wish dreams fulfilled. When you come to corporate worship, come with this attitude. God, burn your truth into my heart. Jonathan Edwards said that the goal of preaching is not just explanation, but impression. The goal is not just to make the truth clear, but to make it real. In other words, true proclamation affects our hearts. And then notice in verse 34, this is where we get the ancient Christian greeting. Let's see how many of you are familiar with it. Uh, he is risen. That's impressive. Very impressive. You get a gold star. He's risen and eat. This is where this is where that ancient you know tradition comes from. Now we arrive at at scene four, another pivot in the story. These two disciples, once they saw the risen Christ, they didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem, which was another seven mile hike. 
And they no doubt planned how they were going to tell the crew of the events that transpire. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus taught me Exodus. Jesus walked me through the book of Nehemiah. Hey, I'm going to tell this part, you tell that part. And so they find the 11 gathered along with others. And before they can unpack what happened, someone stole their thunder. <laughs> the 11 already knew that the Lord Jesus had risen. And we don't know everything that was said as they sat around that house and talked. I'm imagining the lady said, see, see I told you, just believe me, just like my husband and my, <laughs> what did they do? Did they eat? Did they order takeout? Did they have the conversation? Should we go pick it up or should we have a donkey deliver it? I don't know. Verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. <laughs> this is not a hallucination. This is not a Star Trek episode. Beam me up, Scotty. This is another appearance of the risen Christ. And Jesus said to them, peace to you. J.C. Ryle says, this is such a wonderful saying. When you consider the man to whom it was addressed. It was addressed to the 11 disciples who three days before had shamefully forsaken their master and fled. They broke all of their promises. They had been scattered and left their master to die alone. One of them had even denied him three times. All of them had proved to be backsliders and cowards. No word from the Lord is as sweet to the weak as peace to you. We see in this touching saying one more proof that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. It is his glory to pass over a transgression. He delights in mercy. He is far more willing to forgive than men are to be forgiven. He is far more ready to pardon than men are to be pardoned. There is in his almighty heart an infinite willingness to put away man's transgressions. Though our sins were as scarlet, he is ever ready to make them white as snow, to blot them out, to cast them behind his back, to bury them in the depths of the sea, and to remember them no more. He told them in verse 39, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. See, a ghost doesn't have muscle and bone like this. Verse 41, And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. What does that mean? While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. Kent Hughes says they were in a wacky state of giddy disbelief. Like football fans whose team just scored as the time ran out to win the game. Jesus said to him, Jesus said to them, Have you anything here to eat? <laughs> now, this, this is interesting. Look at what they served him for lunch. I mean, after he atoned for the sin of the world, he hasn't eaten in days. They give him fish and chips. At least give the God man some steak, a loaded baked potato. He, he deserves a feast, get him an apple pie, something more than Captain D's. But they eat, verse 50, and Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Man, I'm picturing background music filling the air. Probably from the Jeffersons. Moving on up. No, that hadn't happened. Verse 52. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So they were devastated, but now they have great joy. Evidently, the sadness of physical separation was overcome or outweighed by some cause for joy. And it was an, an ascent of joy. The higher Jesus went, the more joyful they became. If you don't have the resurrection, you don't have anything that can give sustaining joy. 
Verse 53, the story continues, and were continually in the temple blessing God. They were blessing God. Now, we celebrate the birth of Christ, the Good Friday of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, but we do not celebrate the ascension of Christ as we should. We should make a bigger deal of it. When Jesus left earth, his arms were raised in blessing. And as he entered heaven, everyone else's arms were raised in worship. And they started to sing. You know what they started to sing? Revelation 5. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain. And by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. The voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Now that's a good place to end, but I'm not finished. I've been told by seeker-friendly pastors to keep Easter messages short, uh, use it as a hook to get the people back. I'm not doing that. I'm preaching just as long today as I would any other Sunday. Actually, a little longer today. I have uh, four applications for you. Four resurrection applications. The first one is long, don't get scared. The other ones are, are shorter. But I want us to answer this question. How shall we respond to this resurrection? How shall we respond to this resurrection? Well, application number one, examine the evidence. Dr. Aiken is the seminary president where I graduated. He used to talk about resurrection theories. And there are lots of them. I'll highlight eight. I like to give this to you every Easter. There are many different theories of the resurrection. Uh, one was the dog theory, that the dogs just came and ate the body of Jesus. Well, that would explain him not being there. Uh, two was the swoon theory. And this view argues that Jesus did not really die, but fainted because of the enormous physical punishment he suffered. This theory teaches that Jesus regained consciousness in the tomb, unwrapped himself, and managed to move the stone by himself. Once he emerged, Jesus convinced his followers that he had risen from the dead. Barbara Thiering, who teaches at the University of Sydney, Australia, says Jesus was given snake poison to fake his death and later recovered. But there's one problem with the swoon theory. John tells us they actually pierced his side and made sure he died. The Roman soldier knew how to tell if a person was dead. And he was dead. The King Jimmy said, he stinketh. He's dead. The dog theory, the swoon theory, the third is the spirit theory. The Jehovah Witness cult holds to this view. Uh, the Watchtower Society asserts, and I quote, King Christ Jesus was put to death in the flesh and was resurrected an invisible spirit creature. The fourth is the legend theory. Basically, this was the view of the infamous uh, Jesus seminar. Uh, this, this theory holds that over time, the Jesus stories were embellished and exaggerated. And then we have the conspiracy theory, number five. This was the earliest theory. It goes all the way back to Matthew 28, which records that the soldiers who guarded Jesus' tomb were, were bribed by the Jewish leaders to lie and say that his disciples came during the night and stole him while they were sleeping. It's all a conspiracy. And then theory number six. The wrong tomb theory. This is, this is my personal favorite. It's madness, but I, I like it. Uh, the, the women went to the wrong tomb on Easter morning. They left and began teaching that Jesus was risen. Everyone came to see and went to the wrong tomb as well. <laughs> they should have looked next door. 
madness. I'm pretty sure a Duke fan came up with that. All right, then seven, uh, the twin theory. Jesus had an identical twin brother, separated at birth. They did not see each other again until the crucifixion. Following Jesus' death, his twin stole his body and pretended to be the risen Christ. Basically like a first century parent trap movie. Then the eighth theory, the last one, is, is the Muslim theory. Jesus didn't die on the cross, only someone who looked like him. And according to the Quran, this is what Muhammad taught. Now, I'll give a rebuttal to all eight. None of these naturalistic arguments stand up to careful analysis. And virtually all of them have been abandoned or substantially revised. Proponents were selective in the biblical data they affirmed and accepting whatever helped their theories and rejecting whatever did not. Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, people in the first century were more likely to believe than us. They were more gullible. They were easily deceived. We're not like that. We're more sophisticated. We have TikTok. Skeptics say, you Christians believe everything you've been told. Well, that works both ways, friend. C.S. Lewis says we're all tempted to chronological snobbery. We want to think that the past was less intelligent and able than we are. Don't be a chronological snob. Don't be lazy. Examine the evidence. This room is filled with some former skeptics and some current ones. And we welcome your presence and we welcome your questions. Some of you may have heard in college that Jesus' death was borrowed from pagan mythology. It's not true. There's zero evidence. The Greeks didn't believe in a resurrection. They believed you had to discard the husk of the body and the soul would flourish in the afterlife. You can't borrow it from them. They didn't have it. N.T. Wright said outside of Jerusalem, nobody believed in a resurrection. Jewish people only had a foggy view of the resurrection and even it was distorted. They viewed resurrection as national, not individual. The whole nation would arise at the end of time. I'm trying to tell you, you don't have to reject intellect to be a Christian. Bring your brain to the Bible. Why don't you find anything of Jesus' enshrined? Why wasn't his tomb enshrined? Why wasn't his sandals enshrined? You can visit places today where holy men and holy women have died and there will be flowers and cards and candles and memorials. None of that was found at the tomb of Jesus. James Dunn, a New Testament scholar, says there is no evidence of any veneration at the tomb of Jesus. Crowds didn't flock there. They didn't light candles. They didn't mourn and weep. Why? Because he wasn't there. History reveals clearly that it was customary for the tomb of a prophet and a holy man to be preserved as a shrine. Uh, the non-Christ-following Jews follow Abraham. They know where he is buried, Hebron. And many make a pilgrimage to remember their dead leader. Buddhists follow Buddha. He's buried in India. His followers to this day pilgrimage there, mourn and weep. Those who follow Islam know where Muhammad is buried in Medina. They pilgrimage there and wish he were still alive. Those who loved Elvis know where he is buried <laughs> and pilgrimage to Graceland. Why don't Christians make pilgrimages? Because our leader isn't dead. So if you're a non-Christian, don't get lost on issues like dinosaurs and if Adam had a belly button. Deal with the empty, unenshrined tomb. Number one, examine the evidence. Resurrection application number two. How shall we respond to this resurrection? Celebrate it on Sundays. For centuries, Jewish identity had been connected to the observance of the Sabbath, Saturday, a day that is honored and kept sacred to the Lord. I mean, they closed down shops. They couldn't cut their nails. It was a crazy devotion to this day. Yet something extraordinary happened around A.D. 30 that caused a large group of Jews in Jerusalem to change their day of worship from the Sabbath to Sunday. They celebrated it by changing the day. Another way they celebrated it was by taking bread and the cup. Christian scholars and non-Christian scholars agree 
that the earliest Christians celebrated communion. When your leader is martyred, you don't celebrate their death. You mourn it. In the States, we celebrate the birth of Lincoln and MLK. We don't have little ceremonies to celebrate how they were murdered. But we do with Christ. Why? Because he's alive. The earliest Christians believed in the resurrection not because they couldn't find a dead body, but because they found a living Christ. How shall we respond to this resurrection? Number three, proclaim it to the nations. We actually have in this text something Christians coined the Great Commission. Notice in verse 47. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of souls all around the world. Let this resurrection drive you to the nations. Drive you to unreached people groups. Let it drive you to your neighbor. Luke is writing this account. Why are we we studying the book of, of, of Luke? What was the whole context? He's writing this book to convert Theophilus. So who are your Theophili? Christianity is not a leap into the dark, but a leap into the light. Lastly, how shall we respond to this resurrection? Let it remind you of your coming resurrection. Martin Luther said, suffering is intolerable. Suffering is intolerable if you aren't certain of your salvation. Christian, this life is as close to hell as you will ever have. You await a resurrection. The resurrection is more than a consolation for what you've lost. It's a restoration of what you've lost. You don't just get the the body you had back. You get the body you always wanted back. You don't get the life you had back. You get the life you always wanted back. You're, You're not made for this life. You were made for resurrection. And Easter and funeral services shouldn't be the only times we reflect on the resurrection. Don't just die in resurrection truth. Live in it. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, you have hope. I love the way D.A. Carson says it. I am not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. Amen. Let's stand together and pray. Father, you have turned our rebel hearts into believing hearts. You have opened our eyes. We have tasted and experienced the goodness of God, the goodness of salvation. And we can say that it is good. Father, our people are Some are going through difficult things. Difficult things. Help them to get their eyes on the resurrection. For there is their hope. And they can endure anything. Because on the third day, your son walked out of that empty tomb. Father, we love you. Because you first loved us. We are filled today. Because you have fed us with your word. We leave satisfied. Satisfied with your word. That it is enough. It is enough. And all God's people said.